Okay. Welcome to Molecular Biology 101. Um, I am going to um, start to uh, go through my slides. Uh, again, you can interrupt me at any point if that's helpful, um, and, and please do ask your questions. Um, I've also just realized that there's, there's questions on the, uh, there's a chat function on Zoom as well. Um, I can now see that. So if anybody wants uh, to ask me over there, they can too. So during this section, um, I will try to give you an understanding of the processes that plants use to create, regulate, and modify the macromolecules that sustain life. I'm going to be focusing on DNA, RNA, and proteins. What are they? What do they do? How can they be changed? And how can they be measured? So by the end of this, you'll learn the composition and structure of each of these macromolecules and how that defines their functionalities, as well as how they interact with one another and the consequences of those interactions. I will inevitably define the central dogma of molecular biology and examine the ways in which the macromolecules are modified. <clears throat> really, I'm going to focus on how the modifications lead to changes in function. I'm going to give you an idea of the flavor of different techniques that can be used to find changes in DNA, RNA, or proteins across different scales, how to induce the changes either in the lab or in nature and the, and the consequences of them. I'm going to rely on examples from the weed science literature to demonstrate how changes um, happen naturally through selection or adaptation or intentionally through modifications in the lab. And then uh, hopefully the um, illustrations will help you to understand how the modifications alter the plant's ability to survive. So at the end of this, you'll have a better understanding of what these are, <clears throat> what different roles they play, and how to change their form and how that changes function. Okay. If this isn't where you went, you were meant to be, then then hopefully give me a wave. But um, and uh, hopefully we'll go from here. Again, you can feel free to interrupt me at any point, and we can try and talk to, through things. So this is me um, and the two sort of roles that I'm playing in a, on a regular basis. I'm I'm a molecular geneticist, weed molecular biologist here at Rothamsted Research in the UK, and I spend most of my time split between the the greenhouses and the lab. So I'm not much out in the field, but hopefully it'll be clear as to why I'm not much out in the field once I explain more about the type of work that I'm doing. Whoa. So um, just to begin with, uh, here's a really good chance for you to join in the Slido conversation. Um, I'll give you a few seconds just to either click that QR code or to go to slido.com and enter 384694. So before I started being a weed molecular biologist, I was just a plain old plant molecular biologist. And the work that I was doing was fundamental research using Arabidopsis thaliana. Now Arabidopsis was great. And uh, the questions I was asking were really, how do environmental inputs lead to developmental outputs? The work that I was trying to do was, was trying to understand what was the molecular response that was leading to these changes. How could the plant sense and respond to the change in the environment and lead those changes in a fundamental way that allowed it to survive. Rabidopsis was great. It was easy to keep, it was self-fertile, it had a rapid life cycle, there was plenty of natural variation, a really big community, but most importantly, there was much better genomics and genetics tools. So we're all here this week because we know the importance of in developing genomics tools for non-model systems, and hopefully the work that I can try and walk through will show why having those genomic tools is important and, and useful for understanding form and function. So the work that I did uh, during my, my pre-weed biology days was trying to understand how Arabidopsis created its root system architecture in response to osmotic stress. I looked at how light and temperature fed into the circadian clock so that the plant had a 24 hour period. And I did lots of transgenerational memory and understanding of how the, um, what the maternal plant was experiencing led to changes in, in the way in which the seeds were generated and how they behaved. So all of this lends itself well to weed biology because essentially all of these questions are essentially questions about how plants survive. How do they sense and perceive their world and, and adapt accordingly so that they can survive? So this transitioned really nicely over to um, more fundamental research where, um, sorry, where I was applying that fundamental research. Um, and I wanted to try and choose a system to work in. Could have worked in wheat, but um, instead, I, I actually realized that wheat is very hard to keep alive. We have to keep it very tightly regulated with lots of inputs and lots of herbicides. Otherwise what happens is uh, the field looks like this. 
So wheat isn't very good at computing. And it's um, if we stop any of the herbicide treatments, then we end up with a very diverse monoculture. And actually, so the wheats that do survive are incredibly good at surviving. Because if you can think of anything that survives better and more capably, even though humans are trying time after time to kill it, then I will change over and study that instead. But really, what, uh, for me, weeds are the ultimate examples of, of plants that survive despite the odds and do their very best to, um, to make sure that they are going on. So what I wanted to do was to bring them into the molecular laboratory, ask the same sorts of questions, focusing on chemical control and, and cultural control. And essentially, what I would love to be able to do is apply all of the tools and techniques that I used to study in Arabidopsis uh, to agricultural and problematic weeds. So uh, the work that I'm doing in, in trying to understand weeds uh, has led me to do things like trying to understand whether or not various uh, laboratory techniques can change the germinability of, of catapodium. I've looked at morphological and biochemical diversity of Iranian populations with my colleagues there who uh, are start trying to demonstrate that the diversity there is quite broad. Uh, and I've made uh, reverse genetic techniques applicable for non-model species, specifically to blackgrass. So I've been able to create techniques that will um, lead to changes in, in gene expression, loss of function and gain of function in blackgrass. I'm gonna to return to this again. And also I'm generating the blackgrass genome in collaboration with partners at Clemson and with Bayer and at the University of Copenhagen. So together we're making a really lovely blackgrass genome that hopefully will be on Cropedia one day soon. I'm not gonna talk about any of these other things, just gonna focus on the genetics and genomics. The reason I want to do this is to give you an idea of why you might be doing this sort of work. So why do molecular scale research? And really the answer to that question is to understand mechanism. So if you wanted to know how a tractor worked, uh, then really the, the easiest way to do is lift up the bonnet and figure out what's going on under the hood. So uh, if you did that, then you would see the parts list. You would see all of the things that are in, in, involved in making the tractor work. Now, the equivalent to this in molecular biology is, is really having the access to the genome. The genome allows us the complete parts list of the tractor and tells us exactly what, what's there, how many copies of it are there, and what they could possibly be. Now, because seats look like seats look like seats, if you have something that looks like a seat in your genome, then you, have, you can infer its function. So we can learn from model organisms and learn from uh, organisms that are much better studied in order to figure out infer function of what's in the genomes. The other thing that we would do with a tractor if we had the capacity to, to figure out what it was doing was we might take it apart, right? So reverse genetics techniques allow us to determine how something works when we ask by asking what happens when we change it. What are the consequences of altering function, uh, a genetic to phenomic relationships? So for instance, if we took off the front, track, front tire of the tractor, then the, 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 the tractor would no longer function in the way it ought to. And we can infer that, that front tires were really necessary for forward motion. So this is the same in plants. We can essentially remove specific genes of functions and ask what they do, what happens when we take away that one gene. So the picture that I'm showing you here on the left-hand side are sort of unmodified plants. And the ones on the right are ones where I've targeted phytoene desaturase, and that's involved in, in chlorophyll biosynthesis that makes the plant green. So what you can hopefully see, maybe at the back there, uh, what you can hopefully see is that there's uh, these leaves are white and stripy. So this is uh, a way of doing a loss of function mutation. The other thing that we might want to do with a tractor is add something to it, right? So if we stuck a track around the tires, then it might drive better in the mud. And this would be a gain of function because it was would be better able to drive around in England where it rains all the time. So if we, we can do this same sort of thing with plants where we can add various things to them and ask what the, what the consequence is. The picture here on the bottom is ones in which I have, again, on the left is unmodified and the plants on the right, I've added in green, green fluorescent protein. So this is GFP. And what it does is it, it fluoresces when it's interacting with UV light. So what you can see is that some of these plants are green and they're now gaining that function of being fluorescent. So of course, stripy plants and uh, fluorescent plants are really cool, but they don't actually allow us to uh, sort of do anything about herbicide resistant plants in the real world. So what I'm showing you here in this big image is actually plants in which I've taken away a single gene of interest uh, and removed the AMGSTF1 from blackgrass. 
And I've converted resistant plants into sensitive. So this allows me to say that this one gene is, is sufficient to confer the, the resistance and necessary for resistance in black grass. So this is much more of a practical uh, approach for, um, for, for you know, actually figuring out what black grass is doing in the real world rather than the striped plants. But nevertheless, it works on the same techniques and the same technologies. Likewise, I can do a gain of function and add in herbicide resistance to black grass. So these plants I've added in Boston resistance, and you can see when I spray with challenge, the ones on the left die, uh, the one in the middle survives, and the one on the right has not been not been sprayed at all as a control. So this allows me to say that the Boston resistance gene is necessary and sufficient to allow me to confer herbicide resistance to to challenge. And it's a really useful tool because it allows us to sort of change these properties, both up or down regulation. Okay, so now I've talked a little bit, I've done lots of hand waving and I've talked to you about tractors, but what do you really need to know in determining how something works? So the today's main topic is molecular biology 101. So although I'll continue to refer to tractors and I will bring these examples of gain and loss of function in black grass up again, uh, really what we're going to talk about is DNA, RNA, and proteins. So um, these are the important names for today. So DNA replicates, it creates copies of itself. DNA is transcribed into RNA. RNA is translated into proteins. So this is the central dogma. This, um, this particular diagram will come up again and again, and, um, and hopefully it will help you to understand what I'm talking about throughout the system. Really what I'll be focusing on is the practical nature of it. So that why do these various bits, how do they help us? And how does it help us understand uh, access to genomics, what's going on for gain and loss of function? Okay, so first uh, a number of definitions are ne necessary. So DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. And this is because each strand is composed of a long chain of monomer nucleotides, adenine, cytosine, guanine, or thymine, on a deoxyribose sugar phosphate backbone. Okay, so in the picture, the backbone is the thing that's twisting around, and the um, the nucleic the nucleotides are the ones that are that are binding across the form. Now it forms a highly stable structure of two strands that are spiraled around each other. This is the strands that uh, Rosalind Franklin discovered, and Watson and Crick made famous. Uh, and when you think about sort of the classic structure of DNA, this is this is what it is, right? DNA is also the genetic information, and this is because it acts as a template for the replication of more DNA molecules. And it also passes on the appropriate information to make RNA. RNA itself is ribonucleic acid, and it's typically single-stranded. So RNA is composed of a chain of monomer, nuclei, monomer nucleotides. Ooh. You guys good? Cool. Um, DNA, RNA, uh, sorry, RNA is composed of adenine, cytosine, guanosine, or uracil, so U, not T, and it's on a ribose sugar phosphate backbone. So this is why it's ribonucleic acid. The reason that I'm underlining these things and emphasizing the differences is because they're structurally different and they're also chemically different. This means that we can differentiate between RNA and DNA, but also the differences in stability. So DNA is quite stable. It's the structure that's bound around itself, RNA single-stranded, and it's much less stable than DNA, okay? So the sequence of RNA is determined by the sequence of DNA, and it can adopt different and secondary structures, and each of these structures can act like uh, enzymes and catalyze activities. Messenger RNA is the one that I want you to remember today. So messenger RNA or mRNA is important because it, it is the template for proteins. Now, proteins themselves are large molecules composed of one or more chains of amino acids, and they have a specific order of amino acids that are determined by the base sequence of the nucleotides, in the RNA, and therefore from the DNA. So it works backwards through that again. DNA makes RNA makes protein. So proteins are required for structure function and regulation, and each has unique functions. So these are the ones that we typically think about. They're the things that we, that we think about as doing the stuff that needs life. So proteins are frequently, um, they frequently interact with each other, they interact with RNA, and they interact with DNA. Okay, so they serve a function. Again, the important thing here is really that DNA makes RNA, makes protein. There are ways for it to go backwards and for the information to go, but that's uh, quite unusual. So really just DNA makes RNA, makes protein for the purposes of today. <laughs> 
So just to sort of focus in on proteins, as I said in the beginning, proteins are kind of the things that do stuff, right? So if we were to go back to the tractor, uh, proteins are the drive shaft, they're the axles, they're the spark plugs, that sort of thing. They're the bits that are doing the functions inside the tractor that allow us to have the, the, the activity. So we know a lot about proteins. These are things like e EPSP synthase and uh, ACCase. So these are the bits that are often targeted by herbicides and that are necessary for life in general. So we know about proteins because if you uh, add glyphosate to EPSP synthase, then it binds in the active site that it is no longer able to function. The plant is no longer able to make ar aromatic amino acids and it dies. So again, tying this back to, um, to weed molecular biology and to what's going on out in the field. So proteins are the things that we inhibit with herbicides for the most part. So proteins not only do stuff, they interact with each other. So uh, dynein and kinesin walk around on microtubules to, in order to move, micro, move, think, move cargo around the cell. Again, these are also targets of uh, herbicides and they're really important for, for life in general. They allow us to respond to bits and they, and they allow things to move around in circles. So these are proteins interacting with each other. Proteins also interact with RNA. They're really important for initiating translation. So remember I said that RNA makes, RNA is translated into proteins and proteins themselves are important. They bind to the messenger RNA and tell it what to make and how much of it to make and how to convert it into what needs to be made. They're also important for splicing. So uh, I'll come back to this again a, a little bit later when it comes to um, sort of conversions, but uh, the um, proteins are also important for altering the way in which uh, RNA is spliced. Proteins also bind to DNA. So when we think about chromosomes, we think about this really nice exit structure. And actually what that really is, is DNA bound around nucleosomes, which are proteins. And then these are wound around each other and they're wound into this really tightly coiled coil. And that makes up the structure that we think about as DNA. DNA, what we actually see is really the combination of, our, of DNA and proteins together. So hopefully that's clear about proteins, what we'll do is we'll move on now to DNA. So again, DNA is made up of ACG or T on a de deoxyribose sugar phosphate backbone. They're the two strands of interwound uh, spiraled around each other and they're highly stable and they have the genetic information. So when we think about these images of cell biology and replication, so this blue dot here is actually the DNA that's been stained with specific dye. You can see it replicating, starting to separate across the two different daughter cells they separate to two different ends of the, the cells and those the cells divide, leading to two genetically identical cells if the replications happened exactly, right? So DNA is replicating itself. It's also the basis of this chain. So DNA makes RNA makes protein. So DNA is replicated. It transcript the transcription to RNA and translation to proteins. Now, the reason that this can happen is because when you open up DNA, there's information that's contained inside of it. Again, AGCT in a specific order. And that specific order actually is quite important because there's different things that uh, are encoded for by the, the information in DNA. So there's different parts of DNA. There's things like promoters, enhancers, which um, alter whether or not the, how much of the, the DNA is going to be bound, how accessible it is. Uh, and then there's also things like introns and exons. So the introns and exons, the exons are what make up the mRNA that goes into the protein and the introns are the bits that get spliced out. Now this leads to differences in regulation, but also it's uh, differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. But anyway, that's a slightly different thing. We're just gonna assume that we're talking only about plants for this talk. So I talked about the fact that DNA makes, pro makes RNA uh, and that happens because when the DNA opens up, it's accessible then to RNA polymerase. The RNA polymerase is actually a protein. So it comes in and it, and it converts the, uh, the DNA information into RNA information and it changes it to ACG or U and there's a perfect, mis ma perfect matching. So A binds to U, T binds to A, C binds to G, et cetera, et cetera. So that information is passed on at, at high fidelity rates. So DNA can also be opened up and uh, proteins again, play a role in replicating DNA. So um, 
can you guys see my screen? I've just gotten a, a notice that said participants can now see your screen. Okay, thank you. Um, so DNA gets opened up and it can be replicated. So you can end up, you know, as I showed in that last cell biology picture, it opens up, the lagging strand gets built, the leading strand gets built. You can make a perfect replication. Those can split off and you can end up with two daughter cells that have identical ge genetic information. So let me just tell you a little bit of it. I'm gonna show you this really awesome uh, um, movie that I stole from this website that's credited here. Um, and basically, hopefully this will illustrate the central dogma a little bit better than I've told you so far. So DNA is housed within the nucleus of the cell and there it's very stable and very well protected. DNA is transcribed into RNA and the RNA is transported out into the cytoplasm. Once it gets to the cytoplasm, the information that's contained on the DNA is used and the exons are spliced together, the introns are removed and you end up with an mRNA. Now the mRNA is actually a mobile unit. It can move around the cell, it moves through the cytoplasm and it contains the information that's necessary to lead to the protein. But in order to transfer that information to translate that information, it needs another partner. So it needs a ribosome. So the ribosome is an RNA protein complex. It binds to the mRNA and it's a docking point for transfer RNAs, tRNAs. Now these tRNAs have different colored feet and you can see that they're binding in threes to different colored pieces on the mRNA. And that's encoding for the correct protein that should be bouncing across, right? So the tRNAs are bringing in specific amino acids as encoded for by the mRNA and they're binding them together to make the protein. Now this is determined specifically by the DNA. So three base pairs of DNA lead to three base pairs of RNA lead to one amino acid. So three to three to one. So the different amino acids then come together. And once you end up at the end of the mRNA, the ribosome helps that protein to fold into the appropriate sequence and it releases it out so that it can go off and do its function. So functions are things like EPSP synthase, where it goes off and it makes the aromatic amino acids that are necessary for the plant to live. So I said that DNA is highly stable and very well protected. If you think of this actually uh, as, the, um, as the blueprint, so this is something that can be passed from generation to generation so that everybody knows that this is how you build a tractor. Protein stability itself is actually dependent on whether or not the structure and the function of the protein so some things need to be replaced every year, like um, timing belts often go on cars, whereas you only wanna replace the head gasket once, right? So some proteins are very stable and they, sh they should last for a long time. Some proteins are turned over quite quickly and this is actually important for their function. You wouldn't want tires that lived forever because it's important to change them depending on whether or not you're in snow tires or you have uh, you know, summer tires. mRNA is somewhere sort of halfway in between. The stability is, uh, is, is different because it's actively degraded. You want this to be actively degraded because the messenger RNA, remember, makes the protein. And there's multiple copies of proteins that can be made from each messenger RNA. So you wouldn't want the mRNA to be hanging about because then one copy would lead to tons of proteins. And actually you want different accessibility of different proteins at different times. So the messenger mRNA is actually actively degraded and they are turned over quite quickly. So at this point, hopefully it's clear that uh, DNA makes RNA makes proteins and the process between DNA and RNA is transcription. The process between RNA and protein is translation. And at this point, what we're gonna move on to is what are the consequences of changes to these? How do you identify them and how do you induce them? I'm gonna to continue to use this tractor analogy uh, a little bit and I'll come back to it again. But at this point, I wanted just to uh, stop and, and see if there was any questions that were out there, give you guys an opportunity to interrupt me and find out what was clear, what was unclear and what we can try and work on. That was actually a question from last time that didn't archive, but can um, let's hopefully, hopefully this is now active and you guys can try sending me questions. Okay, yes, it is working. <laughs> 
Are there any questions either from the Zoom chat or from the back of the room? Well, anyway, give me a chance to drink some more tea. Oh, good. So there seem to be, uh, Dana, a lot of uh, regulatory uh, differences or different things going on in a plant. Is there some kind of a central command center that's coordinating all of this? Or can you, can you talk a little bit about that issue of lots of uh, micromanaging and microactivity versus a larger uh, global objective that a cell or a plant has? Oh, um, I think if I could identify a central regulator, I would be very, very, very famous. Um, I think what we can see is kind of consequences rather than control centers, right? So I'll talk a little bit more in the next session about sort of how changes are induced and how they how the responses are happening. Um, but essentially, the information is all in the DNA. So the information about accessibility, about promoters that can bind, where proteins can bind to it, where they can't bind to it, how much things are going to be made uh, is, is really encoded for in the DNA. But whether or not it's accessible is dependent on the proteins. So it can be all tightly wound up and, and, and um, condensed and nothing can get in, or it can be really open and accessible and it, and it can be read. So I'll talk a little bit about that in the next session. Um, but to answer your question, it is kind of micromanagement and it's responsiveness rather than one central thing that's, that's it's not like you know the brain is leading to a, a change in my arm when I'm talking with my hands. It's more um, that there's a responsiveness to how things are happening. Okay, maybe I'll just carry on then. Well, there'll be more, more opportunities for questions, but also just type them into the question. Uh, you can type them into the question and answer session of the um, of Slido as well. Okay, so at this point, I'm gonna talk about really the consequences of changes. How do you identify those changes and how do you induce those changes? Okay, so I'm going to start with DNA because uh, changes in DNA then get propagated through to changes in RNA and changes in protein. So mutations in DNA can change the RNA and the protein structure function and sequences. DNA changes are also passed on to subsequent generations. So if you, um, if you make a mutation, this is because the, again, the three letter code of the DNA leads to a three letter code of the RNA, it leads to a change in amino acid, right? So changes in one will propagate through and they will be permanent because if you have a tractor that suddenly has a mutation and it leads to a purple tractor, if it's a level of a DNA, all the tractors that come from that line will now be purple rather than green because it, 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 although it can go backwards, once maybe this purple is advantageous and it will be propagated through. So uh, I said that they can lead to changes in structure function of the, of the protein because there are different flavors of mutation. Now I said that there's three base pairs of DNA lead to three base pairs of RNA lead to one amino acid. So some mutations like silent mutations actually lead to no changes because if you look at lysine over here, where, um, so you end up with a change of a, um, interesting, this is not matching up very well. So if you look at the, the changes in, um, so if you ended up with a T A A, then rather than a A A G, these both encode for lysine. Because as you can see, there's lysines down here. It's got a couple of different variants that you can actually encode for, right? So uh, this is different from if you had a stop mutation. So stop mutations are important because that's the point at which the ribosome stops and it helps fold it and it releases it. So if there's a stop, then the protein uh, production is stopped and it's released out to do its thing. If this happens early, then actually the protein is unlikely to be functional and it will not function properly. There's also missense mutations. There's two flavors of missense mutations, conservative or non-conservative mutations. So conservative mutations are when you go from like to like. Lysine is like arginine. It's both polar and it has sort of the same sort of amino groups on the top. 
Whereas uh, threonine is a totally different beast. It's, it's, it's sorry, uh, arginine is basic, whereas threonine is polar and it's a very different group. So you can see you're, you're asking for Pepsi and you might get Coke, uh, which is totally different than asking for Pepsi and ending up with 7-Up. Okay, so they're very different functional changes based on uh, the way in which the sequences are mutated. So what happens when you, uh, the consequences of DNA changes, uh, you basically, this is the sort of thing that underpins non uh, sorry, underpins target site resistances. So specific changes at the DNA level lead to uh, an enzyme that's either able to be bound by the herbicide and therefore the plant is sensitive, or it leads to a mutated enzyme that cannot be bound by the herbicide and you end up with a plant that is resistant. So massive changes in, in the way in which the, the enzyme is functioning based on changes in which the way it is being folded. So uh, the reason that we can find changes in DNA is because the A, G, C, and T are all chemically different from one another. So when we're drawing these as blob diagrams, they look like this. Uh, here are the actual structures. And you can see that thymine and adenine are different from guanine and cytosine. So thymine and, ad and uh, these are both pyrimidines on the corner here. Whoops, sorry, I'm opening apps. That's not what I want to be doing. Um, so you can see that thymine and cytosine are both pyrimidines, whereas adenine and guanine are both purines. They both have this extra ring compared to this circle. They have binding here, they bind in two places. Here they bind in three places. And so there's very different ways in which they're binding and interacting. So you can differentiate between what they are and you can then figure out what was there based on this, the, the chemistry that's present. So this means that DNA mutations can be identified by many different methods and most of them involve sequencing. So there's you know, sort of traditional sequencing in which you take the regions of interest and you send them through and you determine which base pair is coming up depending on what the fluorophore is doing that's associated with that, that sequencing. There's lovely things like nanopore that allow you to do very long sequencing of single molecules. And there's things like lamp assays that actually work to uh, detect the mutations based on the, um, the, the melting points. So a homozygous mutation acts like this, whereas there's two types of the heterozygous mutations that begin like that, right? So there's differences in behavior of the melting based on the sequences that are present. So how do you induce changes to DNA? Well, you, you live. Um, so basically changes to DNA happen all the time. They happen based on UV damage, chemical mutagenesis, DNA replication, as I said, isn't always absolutely totally perfect. Uh, and these are the basis by which evolution and selection are happening. So there's tons of standing genetic mutation in, in the populations that we are dealing with all the time some of which are advantageous, some of which are silent, some of which are non-synonymous, and some of which will lead to things like target site resistances. So we can induce these in the lab uh, by a variety of different ways. We can take advantage of the fact that there's actually, um, that the, there's standing genetic variation in the populations that we're working with. Uh, we can induce the mutagenesis by exposing seeds to chemicals or radiation. We can do things like RNA interference, which specifically turns off RNA, and I'll talk about this more in a second. Or we can do things like transgenesis and gene editing that are more specific, specific ways in which to alter the, uh, the DNA that's present. Now, actually, the RNA interference, I said I'd talk about it again. This is because this is what I showed you earlier in my stripy plants. So these are plants in which I have removed the RNA so that it can no longer function, right? So what I did was I removed the RNA, therefore there was no protein to be made because remember the protein comes is based on the mRNA, the presence of the mRNA. So removing alter, or altering the mRNA means that the protein is no longer functional. So this is a really a, a quick outline of reverse genetics. So DNA makes mRNA makes protein. Uh, if I remove the mRNA, then there's, there's no protein that can happen and there's abnormal function. Or you can stick in extra mRNA or extra DNA and lead to gain of function, right? So this is the, the, the tractors aren't showing up here. But at any rate, um, there's new functions that can be added in, okay? So the way in which I did this was actually by using virus-mediated reverse genetics. And these take advantage of the fact that in the plant cell, viruses, when they infect, they co-opt the plant's machinery 
So the plant's DNA makes mRNA, makes protein, and they co-opt the translational machinery in order to make their own proteins, which then replicate the viral genome and create the capsids and the viral proteins that are necessary for the, for the, for the virus to replicate. Okay, now the plant doesn't like this. It doesn't really want viruses replicating inside of it. And so what it does is it fights back. So when a virus infects a plant, it recognizes the RNA that's present, the viral genome, and it cuts it up into tiny little pieces. Those tiny little pieces are loaded into what's called a risk complex. And this risk complex goes and it targets and seek seek and destroy sort of thing, where it goes and finds all the copies of the virus genome and it degrades them. Now the virus genome is an RNA, it's a double-stranded RNA. And so this is very useful because what we can do is we can genetically modify these viruses to contain a tiny portion of the plant genome of interest so that when it infects the plant, this gene is then being made to look like it's coming from the virus itself. It's loaded in the risk complex. And so the plant mRNA of interest is degraded as well. So this is a very targeted and specific way in which to alter the expression of RNA levels in in a plant of interest. This is what I did with my stripy plants. I targeted uh, PDS and it led to loss of function of PDS and therefore uh, white stripy leaves rather than happy green leaves. So the other way to do this is to use again, the same sort of process, but instead of uh, adding a tiny piece of the plant gene of interest, you can add the whole plant gene of interest so that when the virus is replicated, it makes its own proteins. It also makes your new protein of interest. Okay, this is what I did with the glowing plants. So I added in GFP into the virus. I infected the plants with the virus. It made GFP at the same time it was making its own replication. So these are different ways in which you can sort of alter the the expression and levels of proteins or levels of RNA in proteins in the lab. So uh, this is quite a dramatic way to change the levels of RNA, but there's also much more subtle ways to look at it. So mutations in the RNA can change the structure and function of the RNA and lead to changes in the structure and function for the protein that it's encoding for. This is because again, DNA is transcribed into uh, RNA and it's translated into proteins. So changes in the RNA will lead to changes in a protein. And I say that this can happen because again, uh, there's the three letter code for the DNA, three letter code for the RNA leads to a one amino acid. So how do you induce changes to RNA? Well, again, you just live right in nature. This is what happens all the time. So the RNA it alters in response to various biotic and abiotic stresses in response to chemical treatments, time of day effects, developmental changes, aging, changes in permitter sequences, accessibility, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So changes in RNA happen all the time. Here's a gene that I used to study and it went up in the morning and went down in the evening and it went up the next morning and down the next evening. And it had this really reproducible pattern This reproducible pattern meant that there was changes in the protein amounts. So you can see it's high and then it goes low and then it goes high again. Um, And these changes in in actual protein amounts led to changes in behavior. Now, if I alter the plants so that they're no longer able to have this rhythmic process, the RNA is a much more flat line. The protein is a much more flat line. And actually I don't have any pictures of the movie, but you can see that these two separating out so that the, uh, the gray one is, is much longer than the, uh, short, than the black ones. So this is ways in which changes in RNA happen on a regular basis, leading to changes in, in, in um, responsiveness. There's also changes that happen for things like signaling cascades. So for instance, if a growth factor is released, it's bound by a receptor, it leads to a phosphorylation cascade. This activates specific proteins that then go into the nucleus, bind to the promoters of of genes that are involved in promoting cell growth and division. They are then transcribed into mRNA. The mRNA is then increased in, in translation which means to increase cell growth and and changes in behavior. So again, these are things that happen on a regular basis in response to signals. And these these cascades are what allow us to sort of respond to environmental cues, pathogens, pests, and all sorts. 
So I talked about the idea that there's differences in uh, the DNA, that they have different promoters and enhancers. Um, and so changes to these promoters and these enhancers will lead to changes in RNA expression. So there could be a, uh, an RNA polymerase that's being bound by a mediator, uh, some sort of bending so that it's being brought close. And so therefore it's much more of it is happening. There's also uh, repressors that could be present or active. Uh, if they're active, then the um, polymerase cannot bind and transcription does not happen. So there's different ways in which we can regulate this. Hopefully this addresses a little bit more your question about sort of master regulators versus responsiveness. Uh, the responsiveness comes in if this active repressor is being bound uh, by this red ball, then it binds to the DNA and the RNA polymerase cannot be cannot act. Uh, if this mediator is involved, then it's bringing these bits of DNA together and it's allowing for transcription to happen. Does this make a little bit more sense? Just give me a wave if that's okay. Thank you. So how do you identify changes in RNA? Well, it kind of depends on which scale you want to play with, right? So um, in terms of, I'm just checking the time, I'm good, okay. So in terms of measuring the, uh, the changes in RNA, um, it depends on whether or not you wanna look at single or a few targets, or if you wanna look at the entire transcriptome. So if you're looking at single or a few targets, you can do things like qPCR or PCR, where you identify a specific gene of interest and measure. You can see that the, the blot that I put here, there are more here on this left-hand side than there are on the right-hand side. If you're looking at the entire transcriptome, what you do is measure the expression of all of them and then measure them against each other. So you can do MA plots. So this is comparing a um, control versus a treatment, a mutant against a wild type, a before versus an after. Now, just to bring in a little bit of humor, I, I call these sneeze plots. Uh, and I think that they were the inspiration for the recent Banksy um, drawing that went up in Bristol. But anyway, these sorts of things, these sneeze plots are, are sort of useful for trying to explore what's happening in your regulation of your, of your, trans, in your entire transcriptome. So now when you induce changes to RNA, uh, or if there's altered levels of RNA, then this leads to altered levels of protein, remember? An enhanced herbicide metabolism is often associated with the ex increased expression of detoxifying enzymes. So this is quite useful because if there's more RNA, there'll be more protein and more protein allows you to do more stuff that allows you to survive, right? So similarly, if there's changes in proteins, that's again, more ability to survive the, the um, toxic environment that's happening, okay? So now we're gonna change over to changes in proteins. So proteins, again, are the things that do stuff. They are the fan belts, the gear shafts, the, the cam shafts, that sort of thing. They're the bits that allow the tractor to function properly. And they can be changed. And when they are changed, it leads to different manifestations of how that tractor is functioning. So there's a relatively straightforward way to change the level of protein that's there. And that's by changing the amount of DNA that's there. Because again, if you increase the amount of DNA, you increase the amount of RNA and therefore you increase the amount of protein. So this is an example uh, from amaranthus where there's an increased copy number of the EPS, EPSPS synthase gene so that there's more copies compared to the expression level. So there's more copies, more expression, more protein. More protein means more able to survive the herbicide that's being treated. Now, some of these are actually being hosted on the um, extra chromosomal circular DNAs. Uh, they can be in the genomes by gene duplication and that sort of thing. Uh, there's various ways that you can increase the copy number of DNA. So the other thing that's uh, that, again, just to quickly remind you, you can increase copy number by just increasing RNA. I did this in the lab by in infecting my plants with a virus that led to increased levels of RNA. Increased levels of RNA lead to in increased levels of proteins. So how do you measure the, identify the changes to proteins? Well, if you're looking just for protein amounts, then again, it matters whether or not you're looking at single or few targets, or if you're looking at the entire proteum. So if you're looking for single or few targets, you can do things like uh, Western blots. You can do things like these lateral flow assays to measure the amount of the protein that's, th that's there. If you wanna look at the entire proteome, again, it's slightly different, but again, it's very useful to have a comparator. So all of these little red dots are different uh, compared to the sensitive for the, for the mutant. So uh, if you want to 
identify the changes to the protein sequence because DNA makes RNA makes protein. If you want to find out if there's differences in your protein, you can go back to the DNA level, you can sequence it and determine whether or not there's differences there. So this is where the International Weed Genomics Consortium is going to help all of us a lot because we can actually then go and query whether or not we have specific genes of interest that are altered as compared to the reference sensitive genomes. So if you don't have a, a genome, it's not all is lost because protein changes can also be identified because amino acids are all chemically different from one another. This is useful because uh, this is represented here in different colors. Uh, I talked about the different behaviors of the plants earlier and how they're encoded for by different things. And we talked about the differences between lysine and threonine and how those are very massive differences. So if you want to identify the sequences, there's a variety of different protein analysis techniques that you can use. Here's a link here uh, that you can use to try and figure out whether or not you have differences in your protein sequence without a genome. So at this point, uh, I have reiterated over and over again that DNA makes RNA makes protein. The process from RNA to uh, protein is translation. The process between DNA to RNA is transcription. Uh, and I've talked about the, what are the consequences to the changes at each scale? How do you identify these changes and how do you induce them? I've used this tractor illustration to try and figure out and, and to push the idea that there's, you know, changes in form can lead to changes in function. At this point, uh, I have questions there that were left over from the previous session that didn't actually archive. But what I would like to do is, I'm gonna archive these now, hopefully that will allow me to go. Uh, nope, it won't. But what I would love for you guys to do is, I'm gonna pause now to try and figure out whether or not there are any uh, questions that you guys have. Uh, again, you can use the chat function in, um, in Zoom. You can write to me on Slido, or you can just jump up and grab the, grab the microphone. So Dana, uh, this is Phil Wester and I worked a lot with Todd Gaines and Eric Patterson on the full uh, genome draft sequence of kosha basia. And when we look at the gene amplification that we see in kosha, uh, it's very interesting that there appear to be a number of other genes that are co-amplified along with the EPSPS gene. So it's not just that gene that's turned into multiple copies, but you have maybe six or eight other genes flanking that region that are also amplified. And certainly one of the thoughts we've had is if you could harness that mechanism somehow for the benefit of uh, something that would be produced in a plant. But can you talk briefly about, is it just random that they happen to get swept up in this, what we think now is a transposon mediated gene amplification event? Um, I mean, it, it kind of depends on, so there are certain sequences that will, will not be random because they will be required for the, the amplification, right? So there's the transposon itself that must hop around or be duplicated. So those sequences are not random because that's really what the mechanism that's underpinning the replication itself. Now, it just happens to be that there is a few genes that are useful then those will, those will be kept. There's probably gene duplication events that are happening all the time, all over the place. But if they don't actually confer a huge selective advantage, like copy number increases of um, the specific gene that happens to break down the herbicide of interest that we're talking about, right? That's a huge selective advantage. So there's probably things that are happening all the time and we just aren't following it because it's not being selected in such a, a massive way by killing off everything that isn't, uh, isn't resistant. There could be some things that are, that are helpful to make sure that that propagation is stable. There's you know, maybe some sequences that we don't know about that are, that are happening. There's also probably just some baggage that comes with because it happened to be in the right place next to the right gene that led to a bit of an advantage, right? In terms of, you know, differentiating between which ones are specific, which are necessary, which are sufficient, which are baggage. 
Um, those are those are hypothesis driven questions that we can then ask. But in terms of you know, off, there's there's nothing that's that's really um, there's no specific sequence or specific thing that we know that is just baggage or it just happened to be coming along or it was super, super, super useful, like that one gene. Does that make sense? Okay. Everybody online is awfully quiet. I'm happy to um, take questions from you guys as well, whatever way C is the easiest. But please feel free to um, you know, stick them into the question and answer session on Slido if you want. I can, I can interrupt myself to answer your questions at any point. Hi, Dana. Thank you. Very nice talk. Um, just wondering if you can comment on uh, methylation and how that could be related to wheat science or herbicide resistance or even uh, in salinity, drought tolerance traits. Yeah. So um, methylation is a, is a way in which DNA is decorated, essentially. So um, if you think about, there's the base structure of the DNA that I talked about, which is the, the, the monomer nucleotides on the, on, the, on the phosphate backbone, right? Now on top of that, you can have different levels of decoration, one of which is, is actually methylation. Now the methylation um, also decorates the histones. And so those are the things that the DNA is sort of coiled around to make it, make it tight or loose. Uh, and so you can change the level of um, the histone accessibility by things like acetylation, methylation modifications, epigenetic modifications, right? So um, those are really not changes to the DNA, but they're changes to the accessibility. So something that is highly modified so that it is condensed and it is no longer being able to be accessed will not be able to be made into proteins because if the, the transcription translational machinery can't get access, then it might as well, you know, it's not there. Again, if you open things out, if you say, hi, I'm here, please come and make more of me. If there's alterations that are along those lines, that will lead to massive changes in the amount of RNA that's able to be made from that DNA. So in terms of herbicide resistance, again, if there's responsiveness, if there's regions of the, of the genome that are typically constricted and not able to be accessed, but those are actually helpful for fighting uh, against the herbicide, then if you relax those and you make them accessible, then that will lead to a, an ability to survive. Likewise, if you have something that's, that should be a, re a repressor and is unaccessible, then again, that will help, that will change the ability of the plant to respond. So understanding the epigenetic modifications that are the layer on top of the DNA information is really important. I decided that I didn't have time to get too far into that because I didn't want to, um, that's incredibly complicated. There's also very little evidence in the uh, weed science literature for modifications and how they're being, how they're changing. But yeah, definitely all the information that we can have on the accessibility, the, the modifications, and the ability of the DNA to become proteins will help us to understand how the plants are able to respond and how they are responding in, in, um, in real time. Okay. So, this has gone a little bit fast. I apologize, ooh, question, excellent. I will go back. Wait, uh, hold on. Gene amplifications with different mechanisms. Uh, so there's gene amplifications with different mechanisms. There's extra, extra ECC DNAs, extra chromosomes, tandem arrangement, et cetera. 
and plant performance. Do you have any thoughts on fitness? Um, the different types of things that you've talked about there are inherited in different ways. So um, extra chromosomes must be properly segregated. So if you have whole things like whole genome duplications, where you go from being a, a diploid to an auto polyploid or you know, increase in ploidy, that sort of thing, those are massive change. And they can either lead to huge structural variations that you go from, uh, you know, from species to species, um, or they are absolute disasters and the plant doesn't actually make it beyond that particular generation, right? So if you think about hybrid vigor, awesome. Uh, the fact that hybrids don't actually replicate beyond, uh, not so useful. So that's, there's different levels for um, when you talk about sort of uh, extra chromosomes and how they're going to be arranged and how they're going to be um, replicated so that the, the next generation can survive. Tandem duplications and sort of local duplications are actually a much more mo minor modification because really you're going from something that's this big to something that's that big. So actually you're not really changing the structure of meiotic or, my, or mitotic divisions. And so it's probably likely that that will be able to persist easier than a whole genome duplication or a whole extra chromosome. These ECC DNAs, I don't know that we know enough about them really yet to kind of understand exactly where they came from, how they're being replicated, how they're being dragged around. I mean, there's lots of questions still about them, um, but they are, they don't, they're not integrated into the genome, right? So they're not a fixed thing that must go on to the next generation with exactly the same number of copies and exactly the same orientation. So they're much more fluid, they're much more responsive, but they also, uh, one cell can get lots and the other cell can get nothing because of the way in which they're parsing. So if they're not totally linked to a chromosome, when the cell division happens and the two sets of DNA are being parsed into the daughter cells, they could be differentially parsed. And so you would end up with some cells that have lots and some that have none. Each of those would have consequences on fitness because if it is a detrimental fitness trait, then actually having some different copies in different cells means that the additive is going to be okay. Uh, whereas uh, if you have an entire genome that must be reanalyzed, that's gonna have a huge consequence on fitness until it's sort of passed itself through. Is that okay? Give me a thumbs up on the on the chat if you're okay with that. Okay, I'm gonna assume that's okay. This is the great thing about not being able to see your faces is I don't know if you're groaning or, or smiling. I'm assuming you're all smiling. So, thank you. Okay, so. During this session, you've gained an understanding of the processes that plants use to create, regulate, and modify the macromolecules that sustain life. I focused on DNA, RNA, and proteins, what they are, what they do, and how they can be changed and measured. I've talked about how composition of these structure of these macromolecules defines what they, how they function, how they interact both with each other and how the interactions are necessary for the replication and for the propagation of the information from DNA to RNA to proteins. I've talked about how the consequences of those interactions can lead to changes in, in the way in which they function. I defined the central dogma, which is that DNA makes RNA makes protein and examined the ways that these macromolecules are modified, right? The focus really was on how the modifications can lead to alter function. And the reason I did this is because Really, we're looking for changes in function when we're looking for changes in herbicide sensitivity. So I talked a bit about the different techniques that can be used. Uh, I've put some links in there that will allow you to uh, examine whether or not changes in DNA, RNA, or proteins are happening at the scale that you're interested in. So totally different techniques if you're going to do an entire genome compared to whether or not you're doing a PCR in the lab to see whether or not the sequence of one gene is actually changed. So the um, examples that I pulled from the weed scientist literature hopefully help to demonstrate why the changes uh, are happening, how they can happen naturally, but also how they can happen intentionally. So the examples really were focused on how the modifications uh, alter the plant's ability to survive. So 
my hope is that by the end of this, uh, we've still got plenty of time to ask questions and I've got some summary slides that will give you some visual uh, reminders of what we've gone through. Um, but my hope is that you'll have a better understanding of what DNA, RNA and proteins are and the different roles that they play and how changing their form leads to changes in function. So this slide is, is hopefully fully embedded in your long-term memory now. So DNA is replicated, it is transcribed into RNA, it is translated into proteins. Uh, they, they move from one to the other. There are consequences of changes and these consequences are manifested in differences in function. So you can have a green tractor that becomes purple, that loses a front tire or that gains a track. So hopefully uh, you also understand a bit better the idea of how you can induce these changes. So the different scales here are actually uh, whether or not there's a minor effect or a major effect on the changes at DNA, RNA, or protein level. So silent or conservative mutations at the DNA level will really have very little function, uh, little effects, whereas nonsense or non-conservative mutations will lead to major effects. There's also the idea that the entire, uh, as we were just talking about, huge chunks of DNA are replicated or removed, and those will have huge consequences on whether or not the, 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 the plant will be able to survive. Again, because DNA makes RNA, there's minor functional changes, whereas there's changes to things like stability, amount, or even presence of RNA. I talked about how you can remove it uh, or add it in. And these lead to changes in function of the, of the protein, either no changes or minor changes or massive changes like non-target site, target site resistance, gain or loss of function. So to just put this back into contents, uh, so if you have the wild type where there's a no mutation, this encodes for a lysine, you can make point mutations, silent, nonsense, or missense mutations. These either the silent changes don't lead to a change in the function of the, of the protein, nonsense mutations stop it, and the protein is probably non-functional and will be degraded really quickly. There's also missense mutations that either are conservative, so you're going for a basic to a basic, or non-conservative, basic to a polar. These then are manifested into changes in like non-target site resistance, where you end up with a single base pair mutation that led, leads to either a plant that is sensitive or resistant. When you're talking about identifying the changes, there's actually, again, a huge range of techniques that can be used to identify whether or not the changes are present. These involve sequencing the entire genome or just a gene of interest by cloning nanopore lamp technology. There's various bits and pieces that you can use. Uh, when it comes to RNA, there's, again, the entire transcriptome that you can do, or you can do things like PCR, qPCR, to try and determine whether a single gene or a small number of genes are changed. You can do the entire proteome and determine whether there are changes in a presence or absence of uh, proteins of interest, or you can do Western blots, which are quantitative and qualitative to see whether size or amount are changed. To put some pictures on these, so nanopore is one of these things that allows us to look at exactly what's happening at a single, uh, single DNA level. Uh, there's also the International Weed Genomics Consortium is going to give us an entire genome or two or 10, which is going to be lovely so that we can have access to the uh, entire gene sequences that are available. So qPCR, uh, actually PCR looks like this, where you have differences in uh, gene expression for the ones on the right compared to the ones on the left. And there's these sneeze diagrams that I showed you where there's entire transcriptomes can be compared against each other to try and figure out what is up or down regulated. Western blots versus proteomes look like this. Again, you have targets of interest versus the entire genome. We are looking at the entire proteome and changes that are being manifest there. When you're talking about inducing changes, again, so uh, in the lab, there are differences for in the nature. Uh, so naturally, uh, evolution is happening all the time. There's increased copy numbers. Uh, thank you, Phil, for pointing out that the idea that there's differences in uh, tandem duplications as well as- uh, It happens uh, at 5 p.m. My, our time. So there's differences. Hi, Eric. Um, there's major changes uh, either also in these extra chromosomal DNAs that are floating around. Um, I talked about the VIGs that I used in the lab, uh, and we talked quite a lot about the um, ideas that there's changes in promoter access that will lead to changes in the ability of RNA to be made or not. So there's uh, box differences that are happening uh, to increase the levels of protein, or there's also uh, the very easy thing of changes to DNA, RNA, or protein stability 
that will lead to changes in the uh, protein in nature. To put some pictures on, uh, I showed you this nice diagram of how crops are genetically modified. And in nature, this is happening all the time in all of the fields and all of the cells and everywhere that we're looking. There are changes in DNA that are happening constantly and continuously. They may not be doing anything and they may not be being selected, but they are happening. So changes, I uh, showed you my VIGS example where they, I took a resistant biotype and it made it sensitive. Uh, but I also talked about the idea that there's active repressors that can be activated and then uh, the RNA polymerase no longer has access and can't be changes in RNA. I talked about my glowing plants, which uh, I'm still very proud of. I think it's a lovely beastie. But anyway, so there's just changes, ways to change in the lab, the level of protein that you have specifically. And also we talked a lot about the idea that, um, you know, changes in RNA and changes in DNA will lead, manifest themselves as changes in protein. I promised you that I would put my email up here and that leave you enough time to ask questions before you need to go on to the next session. Um, but also just wanted to put up some pictures up of some of the stuff that I'm doing here in the labs to play with my, uh, my, my favorite plants of interest. Um, but at this point, I will put this up. The, um, all of the methods by which you can ask me questions are open. There's chat within the Zoom. Uh, please do join the, um, the, uh, the Slido if you want to ask me questions there or grab the microphone. Dana, just a real quick question. Um, you know, there are proteins that are produced in plants that are enzymes. And my question is, uh, what's the range of the half-life of those enzymes before they're degraded and broken down? Uh, are some of them very short-lived and they're, they're gone in a matter of hours or days? And some, I'm just curious whether uh, that type of research has been well-documented. Yeah. Um, so. The short answer is yes, there's a huge range of stabilities for proteins. So when I was working as a circadian biologist, there were, there were proteins that were only, um, we measured exactly 14 copies of mRNA that were present within a cell and they were only present for less than an hour, right? So there are certain things that those proteins are then made and we measured the stability of those proteins and they are also degraded incredibly rapidly and they have a huge burst and then they're gone. We can see this because we can do things like we can tag those proteins with fluorescent proteins or luciferase or other various things, and you can watch them appear and then disappear really quickly. And so we have a really accurate way of measuring when they're present and what's happening. We could do this in weeds. If we had proteins of interest that we knew about, we could add tags to the DNA. They would then be expressed with the tag. We add the appropriate enzymes and we can watch what's happening in real time so if there's a protein of interest that you want to follow, we can ask hypotheses and there's techniques in order to measure exactly where it is for how long, for you know how stable it is. Yeah, right now, now other I'm, things. I'm, I'm interested in ACCA, something I'm working with. Yeah, um, when it comes to specific proteins and weeds, I'm honestly not sure. Um, I can, I mean, we can ask those questions. I can tell you about the different techniques that we could use to find them. Uh, I don't want to give a, a wrong answer by saying that it is short or long lived. So I won't give an answer, but, but what I will say is that there are definitely proteins that last for days, uh, if not much longer. Um, and they persist because they are important. And they also, there's things that are constantly produced. So if you think about housekeeping genes, if you think about ubiquitin, if you think about the microtubule proteins, those sorts of things, things that need to be around actin, um, they are stuff that, that persist. Now, my, my guess is that things like ACCase, which are critical components of stuff that's necessary for life, are probably pretty long-lived compared to short-lived because they are, they are enzymes that are producing reactions that are necessary for the plant to live. It's not like my circadian proteins that, you know, they come out and they do their thing and then they disappear. Um, the, if you think about stuff that's really necessary for, for turnover, for growth, for, for that sort of thing, they are probably much more long-lived than transient responses 
uh, for things like, um, you know, the growth hormone responses, the stress responses, the, the day length responses. But we could measure it is the, is the long and short of it. Um, there's ways to specifically determine the length of proteins and the half-life of proteins. Uh, so there are technical ways that could be done. I don't know of anybody that's done it specifically yet, but it doesn't mean that it can't be done. Uh, there was a follow-up question to um, what I say that ECCs and Palmer amaranth does not affect their fitness because the extra copies are not integrated into the genome. Um, not necessarily, because you're still, um, as we talked about, it's not just those, it's not just the one important gene that's on the ECC DNA. And so as a consequence, there might be other things that are affecting the fitness sort of um, accidentally. So it could be that there's, you know, just the, 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 the copying of those, the regulating of them, the moving them around. It could be that they're affecting fitness in an indirect way, uh, not just a direct way. So again, these are the sorts of things that need to be tested. They are testable uh, and, and testing fitness is neither easy nor straightforward, but um, it's, it's hard to predict whether or not uh, copy numbers are going to actually be altered, um, altering fitness without, you know, having that sort of uh, enough data to demonstrate that fitness has changed if. I recognize that you guys um, were supposed to end at quarter two so that you can get to your next session by four o'clock. Um, I, um, I appreciate the questions so far. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to continue to take questions. If you guys need to change over and, uh, and move on to the next room, then I would understand. And um, But again, my email is on the screen. I'm very happy for you guys to contact me afterward. If there's something that comes up, uh, the Slido will close and obviously the chat on Zoom will not be functional, but I'm happy to take questions by email afterward if there's things. Um, but also, you know, if there's stuff like, uh, if you wanna talk more about sort of measuring protein amounts of specific targets and which techniques might be, might be used, I'm happy to have those discussions afterward as well. <laughs>